Hi guys. Today we're going to look at the Cultural Revolution, a political movement in China that lasted roughly from 1966 to 1976. It's one of the less well understood revolutions out there. We have a pretty good understanding of the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the American Revolution, and even the Chinese Communist Revolution. But the Cultural Revolution is still a mystery. Why? Probably because we still don't know what exactly it was. Now that's not surprising given how young it is as revolutions go, but even then the culture part of it, and the revolution part of it, still don't make a whole lot of sense. In fact, Enver Hoxha, communist leader of Albania, described the cultural revolution as neither a revolution nor cultural. So what are we left with? Let's take the phrase apart and look at what's going on. Revolutions usually involve a different form of government replacing an existing one, and usually in a very short space of time. And culture involves, well, culture, a way of life, a worldview, a way of doing and thinking and seeing things shared by a group of people. Now, was the Cultural Revolution a revolution? And how did it involve culture? What kind of culture was involved in the Cultural Revolution? It all started with a play written in Beijing in 1959, where an honest civil servant has to put up with a corrupt emperor, standard fare in a Chinese story, and in fact the play was praised by Mao, the leader of China. But there were whispers at the time. The corrupt emperor was in fact Mao, and the civil servant was an official of the Communist Party of China, or CPC, who had just been disgraced for speaking out against Mao's destructive economic policies that ended up killing millions of people. A couple of years later, it was Mao's turn to be disgraced. He took the blame for his economic policies, and he was now eclipsed by his rival Liu Xiaoqi, who started to bring China closer to a capitalist system in order to fix the economy. So what about that play? Mao never quite forgot those whispers, and he wanted to get back into the game. At the same time, he thought Liu was bringing China away from communism. He wanted a new type of culture to replace this new capitalist-style culture. In other words, he wanted a cultural revolution. In 1965, he made his move. Mao created the Cultural Revolution Group to shake things up for his rivals. And one of the first things it did was to accuse the playwright of being a traitor to communism, a spreader of bad culture. And the implication was that the same could be said of his boss, Mao's rival, Liu Xiaoqi. And things snowballed from there. The Cultural Revolution Group next targeted Beijing University for a shakeup, getting thousands and then millions of students fired up to protest against the faculty now, a lot of them were simply fed up with how conservative the university was, but with the Cultural Revolution group involved, they started chanting about sweeping away traitors to communism and pledging undying loyalty to Chairman Mao. It was these students, now called Red Guards, who led this Cultural Revolution. They were given one standing order by Mao, to rebel. And that's just what they did through their Destroy the Four Olds campaign. One of these four olds was old culture, and this involved destroying a lot of priceless ancient artifacts and culture, including breaking into people's homes to wreck old furniture, and even digging out the remains of an ancient Chinese emperor and burning them. The Red Guards were given about two years to loot and pillage their own country, until Mao reigned them in and sent millions of them to live in the countryside. Now, beside the Red Guards destroying old culture, the government itself also did a lot of cultural damage. Old books and plays were replaced by CPC-approved works. The Little Red Book basically became China's Bible, while new books, plays, and concerts all had to strictly follow Maoist thought. Millions of writers and artists were censored, thrown in prison, or driven to suicide. Little surprise that during the whole decade of the Cultural Revolution, only about 100 books were published. Meanwhile, 
China's working and family culture also changed. Loyalty to Maoism was the only thing that mattered. The CPC encouraged workers and farmers to abandon their work and hunt down traitors, and factory bosses who tried to get workers back in line would face trouble. Universities favored students based on their loyalty to Maoism, and young people were encouraged to rebel against their parents, even report them to authorities if they seemed uncommunist. Meanwhile, millions of the students sent to the countryside learned nothing there. They became a lost generation who came back to the cities and towns with nothing but bitterness and confusion. So looking back at all this, it's pretty clear that the Cultural Revolution's only claim to culture was a destructive one. It was catastrophic to China's culture and did nothing to replace what was destroyed with anything new. So what about the revolution part? Now, right off the bat, we can rule out the Cultural Revolution as a revolution. In 1966, the CPC was in power, and in 1976, it was still in power. But we could see it as a failed revolution, a coup. Remember the Cultural Revolution group? It was made up of left-wing radicals in the CPC, including Mao's wife, Jiang Qing, facing down the old guard conservative wing of the CPC, associated with the military and headed by Liu Xiaoqi. When we view the Cultural Revolution as a power struggle between these two groups, it suddenly makes a lot more sense. Radicals versus conservatives, with Mao supposedly neutral, but basically the puppet master behind the radicals. Mao thought the CPC was compromised by traitors to communism, and he thought the country was going down the road to capitalism, so naturally he would look for help from the outsiders, from radicals in the CPC and from students. These would be the ones to destroy China's new capitalist culture, which was convenient for the radicals, since this would involve destroying their rivals in the CPC too. And this explains why the students were used to shake up the system, and why the old guard on one occasion actually called in the army to stop students from destroying the Forbidden City. And it explains why Jiang Qing and the radicals first took down Liu Xiaoqi, then one successor after another, in order to dismantle the old guard. This power struggle carried on into the 1970s, with an uneasy balance reached by 1973, Things were looking good for the radicals when one of the last founding fathers of the old guard died in 1976. But Jiang Qing overplayed her hand. Mao also died in 1976, but she figured she was now strong enough to take power. But she had not counted on the fact that the people were sick of all the chaos of the Cultural Revolution and that the only thing keeping the radicals going at this point was Mao's protection. And so a certain conservative hotshot named Deng Xiaoping was able to quickly gather support and finally take down Jiang Qing and the radicals. And thus ended the radical coup within the CPC, and thus ended the Cultural Revolution. Deng would go on to steer China toward a different path, away from Maoism, which would seem like a revolution, back toward what Liu Xiaoqi had been aiming at all along which doesn't seem like much of a revolution. Looking back at it all, it's still hard to figure out what the cultural and revolution parts of the cultural revolution actually mean. Or is that even the right way to look at it? Maybe it all started with the cultural revolution group, or Mao's desire to get back to communism. In the end, it's pretty hard for anyone to agree what exactly the cultural revolution was and good luck getting the Chinese authorities to shed any light on it. You make up your mind on what the Cultural Revolution was, and how cultural and how revolutionary it was, but I'll settle on it being an ironic term, a culturally destructive, failed revolution. That's it for now. See you next time.